Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Pete Goodyear, Pete is headmaster and CEO at Bead School. Welcome to the podcast, Pete. Thank you very much, Jono. First of all, for our listeners, tell us a bit about what you do. So I'm, as you mentioned, I'm the head and the CEO of an educational trust in the UK. We're based down in um, East Sussex, down on the South Coast. 
we've got a combination of schools. So we've got a prep school, which has children from six months old all the way through to 13. And we've got about 270 children in that um, in that part of the, the, the trust. And then we've got a senior school, which has got 820 pupils in it, um, slightly further inland. And the other thing that we do is we run a international summer school over the summer months. And the opportunity there is to bring um, international pupils to the UK to do a variety of things. Part of it is cultural, but part of it is English language and other elements of academic study at the same time. And that constitutes um, the Beads Education Trust. Fantastic. Thank you for filling us in. And uh, I wasn't really aware of this idea of education trust myself, uh, because it's um, it's a little bit different to what we have here in Australia. Similar idea, but uh, I only came across that a few years ago when I started working with a education trust, and um, really uh, because we have a lot of educators from all around the world. And so I think just before we jump into your story, can you just explain a little bit of of what a trust is in the context so, of the UK education system? So I think it it, it differs depending on so so the notion of a trust is just a collection of schools and coming together and working collaboratively in a particular way and so that's that's the part of it for because we're an independent school our element of the trust is that we are we are essentially a charitable trust and so a lot of what we do um, is is based around charity law and we've got to act in a way that is um, in line with charitable law as well as educational law. So that's the part of the trust. We've, we're a school that has existed since 1895. Our prep school started then. And then in 1978, we then opened a senior school. And that senior school a year later in 1979 moved to its, its current location. And in the years since was when the sort of summer school came online um, and the school has grown during during the course of those 42 years. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for giving us a bit of the history, and um, I thought that might be of interest for listeners. More interesting, though, is Pete's story. I'm really excited to hear a bit of, of your story. Let's start with your childhood. Growing up, Pete, what were some of the moments or even themes from that season of your life that shaped you into the person and the leader you are today? Um. So I grew up in South Africa and um, spent most of my my childhood having a truly um, wonderful time um, playing lots of sport, spending lots of time outside um, and really just enjoying what I was doing. And it was a, it was a period in South Africa where apartheid was um, was was the overarching philosophy of the government and i think if if i look back at that particular time i think when i when i consider the way in which i approach things now i think i approach things now knowing the aspects or the entirety really of what apartheid was and the regime that apartheid was and thinking that actually we've got to create a society which is very, very different um, to that. In other words, a celebration of diversity, a celebration of inclusion, a celebration mm. of um, people's differences and the importance that difference brings and how rich organizations can be by celebrating that difference and that diversity and it's something that i strongly believe in and i think it is rooted in the um the very very horrible nasty um approach that existed during the apartheid years in south africa mm. so that's the that i would say the as a, as an overarching sort of theme i think was one my, my father was a was a vicar in in South Africa he was a, a minister of religion <clears throat> and a grown grown up and he his 
his belief around that is something that is him and a, him and a, him as a role model in that regard is has been so so powerful because he he was always somebody who believed so strongly in the importance of that diversity and that inclusion and the equity in which we treat others and we treat those around us mm. one of his one of his um sort of acquaintances and someone that I had the fortune, although I didn't really realize it at the time, um, the fortune to to meet when, when he visited um, was Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And again, his real focus on, um, on justice, on humanity, on the importance of compassion and care for one another um, is so so strong and so important and also the other thing which is really important um, and it has become increasingly important over recent years is um, the concept that he spoke about and he, and he and he did some work with the Dalai Lama on was the the whole area of joy and the importance of joy in our life experiences so I think fundamentally those would be the things if I, if I were to pick pick up um, sort of themes or or times in my mm. in my childhood that that have molded me. I, I'd probably put it put it down to those sort of things, really. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for sharing those. Uh, yeah, parts of your childhood and how that's shaped you. Like you said, to have such a passion now for um, leading an organization and, and being part of a culture that. Um, embraces diversity that's that's uh, really awesome to hear the backstory for you there pete what about leadership opportunities do you remember some of the first leadership opportunities you had whether it was when you were really little or in sports and teams in, in south africa um or when you were older and in work what comes to mind i think yeah i think i had opportunities and and certainly there were opportunities that i've learned from um, and when it, whether it was um, being being a prefect at school or or being a captain of 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 a team, and the that i that idea, I think at that particular stage, it, it's quite it's quite interesting thinking back to to being a being a um, a, a school prefect um, with w with seniority at a at a time. Um, when, when my focus was a lot around sport, but then also you realize the importance that actually, if you want people to do the best that they can possibly do, you've, you've got to come at it from an angle of compassion and you've got to come at it from an angle of kindness. And even, even now I think back and during those, during that time in the, in the early 1990s, late 1980s. You know that time was one where my my focus was probably molded in leadership by being kind and being compassionate and particularly when you're in school you've got to remember that you, you're developing younger pupils to become better versions of themselves and i think the only way you can really do that is is by by showing them that compassion and by showing them that kindness so that they can develop their own sense of self-confidence, their own sense of self-worth that they then can go on and do incredible things. I think if you, mm. if you try and instill a culture of fear or a notion of fear, even when you the captain of, of a sports team or you a school prefect or whatever the case may be, I think you just, it just becomes a detrimental, um, team culture or a de detrimental organizational culture in which people don't then seek to take opportunities or look to take risks because they're too fearful of the consequences. And I think that then it, it lessens everything for all of us, really. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I agree. Um, so tell us a bit about your pathway from growing up to end up doing what you're doing now. Tell us a, a bit, give us a bit of a snapshot. I know you could probably, everyone could could spend hours giving the details of their story, but give us a bit of the overview of Pete's leadership journey to end up doing what you're doing now. 
so I started um, teaching in South Africa and then I, I came over to the UK and was very fortunate to um, meet an incredible headmaster of a school um, in just outside of London. And he gave me a, an opportunity to join his um, his school. And the one thing that he le- he taught me, and I was there for 12 years, I taught there for 12 years. And the one thing he taught me during my time there was you've got to give people opportunities and you've got to back people. And I'm hugely, hugely thankful to him for the opportunities that he gave. Um, his name was Chris Tung, and I still and I still strongly believe that the faith that he had in me to take on leadership responsibilities, whether that was having been in the UK for two years to become a head of department, to run a psychology department, to then become a housemaster of a, of a, in, in, in a boarding house, to then become, um, to then to be able to use that as a step on to, to go off to um, another school to become the deputy headmaster and then come along here is just having the, he was someone that just, just believed in people and could see potential in people and, and would take a, in a, in a way he would take a punt on, on people to, to perform at a particular level. And he was very, very keen to give people the opportunities. And I think if I cast my mind back to the individuals that I worked with at that particular time at that school, um, the number that I've gone on to senior leadership roles in schools um, is pretty impressive um, based on his um, based on his sort of leadership development and uh, and the way in which he he would sort of um, promote his own as it were. Yeah, can I um, ask you? Do you remember the moment where he first invited you into? sort of leadership do you remember um or one of the first moments and and what the conversation was like if you bring your mind back so very interesting so i'd been as i said i was teaching in south africa i'd come over to the uk and he essentially like i said took a punt on me to come and teach at his school and i had done my my teacher training in in history and um economics but he had but then i had my 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 first degree was in clinical psychology so having been in the uk for two years he wanted to expand the sixth form um curriculum for um for the school and he wanted to introduce psychology and he just called me in and he said you're the only person on the on the staff that has a degree in psychology, what are your thoughts about setting up and running a psychology department for us? And I was slightly taken aback, but obviously delighted with the opportunity. And he said, well, it's obviously we'll do a formal process, we'll go through it. But ultimately, if I if I if I look around, I said, I think you best place to to take on that role. And it, it, it was almost as succinct and as quick as that for him to say, look, I've, I've, I've taken a, I've done my homework. I've had a quick look at your, your, um, your CV again. And I think you would be well placed, um, to, to do this job, um, which I then did and I did it for 10 years and, um, <laughs> I would like to think did it really, really successfully. And and that's just because there was a gratitude for him and mm. at the same time as a a realization that when somebody gives you that opportunity, the thing that you do is you take it with both hands and you make it as impressive, as successful as you possibly can. Yeah, that's so good. Thank you for sharing that story. Um any other story? Is it Chris that you said his name is? Yeah. Yeah. Are there any stories, any other stories from Chris's leadership that pop into your head where you watched how he managed a crisis or how he um, dealt with with people or any other advice he gave you that sort of stuck with you ever since? 
I think the the one thing that that he was remarkable. He he always wanted the best for everyone, and the thing that he was so good about doing was ensuring that he had the best that he could have across his across his common room and across his staff. And it's it it the. the what was always interesting was the way in which he sometimes used to interview people for roles. So he'd do the conventional thing of, of having them in his office and um, sitting them down and asking questions. But he also had a real knack of looking to identify individuals. And this was, this was obviously a time in, in the, in, um, the late 1990s. So before AI and all these sort of things with with regards to CVs and LinkedIn and all these sort of things where you can actually take a real much closer look at people's online reputations and stuff. And a lot of it was obviously reliant on pe what people wrote in their CVs. And when people used to write about what their interests and their hobbies were, Chris had a, um, a wonderful way of testing that so i remember somebody came to um be interviewed for a teacher of modern foreign languages at the school um sort of uh, um teaching french spanish and german and this individual claimed that they had the ability to play the viola to a very very high level so chris promptly got his um pa to get a viola from the music department um, to be delivered to his study um, and then ensured that this this individual could actually play the, the viola and made him play a piece of music on the viola to show <laughs> that he was actually playing able to play the viola rather than just having written it on his CV. And the same he did with somebody who claimed to be a very good um, offspin bowler. Um, where Chris promptly got a cricket ball out of his top drawer in his office and um, went into the um, corridor adjacent to his, his office and made this, this prospective member of staff bowl an over of off breaks to make sure that he could actually bowl um, off breaks um, rather than just <laughs> simply saying that that's something that you do. So so what was really interesting is is... It's about being really, I think it's, it's about having that forensic overview in terms of your recruitment that he had, but also a, a, a real vested interest in the individuals and what the individuals were, going, were able to bring to the, to the organization in the broadest possible sense. Yeah, that they're great stories. I love that. It's, and I'm, a, I'm a big fan where it's possible of, um, wherever possible, getting people to come on board and do a project with you, which, which education is a really hard one for this because it's very different. But in, in other spheres where you can get someone in to do a project with you, almost, you know, actually get to see them bowl for a bit, see what they're like on the team. It is so advantageous yeah. if you can do that. I just love how practical that was. Oh, you can play the viola. Grab a viola. Let's hear some viola. <laughs> You're yeah. just so glad that that person, you know, Anyone who just thought, oh, what sounds good? Oh, yeah, plays the viola, chucks that on, is is in for um, an epic <laughs> disaster in that moment. But, um, yeah, yeah exactly I, right. I love that. He was obviously on the lookout looking for, okay, if, if this is something you can bring to our school, then where might that fit in? If you are a great off-spin bowler, maybe you can be really instrumental in our cricket program. Or I imagine the way he's looking so um, deeply into all those other skills means, like you said, he had a real knack for finding where people could add value yeah exactly right exactly right they're great <laughs> stories pete uh, what about aha moments for you you know in your career so far since then are there any aha moments that really stand out for you where you dropped the ball and and uh you've never forgotten it or where you had a big win or um learnt a, a leadership lesson that's really stuck with you since then i i, I it's it it might seem um, <clears throat> it, it might seem that that we've well, it, pro it probably is at the moment. We've heard enough of COVID um, <laughs> and and the pandemic. 
but I think certainly for me and my team here, I think the our response to the pandemic has been has been instrumental in the manner in which we've been ab- able to navigate those pretty choppy, pretty turbulent times. And the thing that struck has struck me as a consequence of that is is twofold. One is the importance of the closeness of your collaboration with your 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 senior team and i think spending more time in in a way we landed up spending more time although possibly remote and online more time with one another during that period of time than um than we had previously but i think that's what was required and it was really really important because we needed to see in a way we needed to on a, on a daily basis see the whites of each other's eyes in respect of how we were responding and we needed to have that strength of unity in the manner in which we were dealing with things because no one's ever written the playbook for dealing with a pandemic in 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 schools and therefore having that close collaboration and those close conversations to work out our response and how we were going to deal with it was really Mm. really important and i think as a as a as a community that strengthened us yeah and obviously it's taken a significant toll on on individuals and people's well-being and all those sort of things but i think as 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 a as a as a senior team i think that was really important for us i think more broadly what we found was crucial was communication <clears throat> and you can never ever communicate enough and I think the important thing there is is just keeping people informed, even if what you're informing them of is telling them that there's going to be more information coming out in two days' time. Um, yeah. So even telling them there's nothing really coming out, but we're just telling you, so you just keeping calm. And we had a bit of a we had a motto that w- around that we wanted school to be something that parents was because of everything else that parents were worried about and concerned with and members of staff were concerned with, we we wanted as best as we possibly can for school to be one less thing to worry about rather than one more thing to worry about. And again, it comes back to that that focus around being Mm. compassionate, being caring, being empathetic to the challenges that were being faced by people, um, both locally, but also internationally, because we do run a big boarding community and a a significant number of that boarding community are international pupils who are from all across the globe and the uncertainty for them was 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 significant and whether that was about getting home at different times during the pandemic or whether it was getting to school during different times in that pandemic um it was all about keeping people informed and updated on on how things were progressing and our response and, and what we were intending to do yeah that's i think education it's like you've explained education has been it's been i know it's covid has uh, been horrible for many people and organizations people have literally lost their lives people have lost loved ones um different industries where it's really hit hard in in different ways travel and but wow education has been really oh it's been fascinating to watch because it's through COVID, it's been a front line. Uh, people who who haven't yep. been able to stop work, um, and in many cases where other workloads have shifted from at work to working remotely, or things have changed. But in some times there for education, it was like the workload doubled. You had people yeah. that you still had to have at school, <clears throat> and you had then online. And I was I've been watching over the past couple of years, educators. It's it's been a real. Um, it's been a real challenge. How, yeah, well, what have you, I think the big question that a lot of people are asking is how can we take the lessons like you just described there that we've learned through COVID and apply them in the future? What do you see for education? What does it look like to make sure we learn from COVID and take those leadership and educational lessons forward? The 
the, the phrase that we used during COVID was there's no point in waiting for the rain to pass. You've sorry, there's no point in waiting for the storm to pass. What you've got to do is learn to dance in the rain. And so we use that because yes, it was difficult. It was challenging. It was really impactful as you, as you've just indicated, John, on, on so many people in so many different ways, but it was what it was. And we needed to make the best of the really, really difficult situation. So that I think is 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 the one thing is is when you are in a in a difficult situation and, and a crisis is is about being bold, being courageous, and and fronting up to those challenges and not being afraid of those circumstances. And I think that's the one thing it, it, it's taught us to be bold. It's taught us be to be courageous. And, and have a strength of conviction in the way that you respond to things and, and have a belief that what you're doing is the right thing. Because as I said earlier, you know, no one had a, a playbook for dealing with the pandemic. And there'll be things that'll come in the future where a playbook hasn't necessarily been written. So I think that's important. The other thing is, I think, coming back to something I mentioned earlier, is that we now... And we've certainly focused at beads. We've done a huge amount of focus on this concept of joy in education. And I think what we've learned from, from this, this, this experience is that people's, people's focus and people's emphasis is actually about enjoying what they are doing and the benefits of that joy. And so we talk about beads being a place where, where children can find joy in their pursuit of brilliance, that that, that, is, that is the the vision that we have. And it's it's really important because if you're not doing that, if you're not enjoying what you are doing, if you aren't finding a love of learning and enjoying the experience of being in school and being educated the rest of the things don't fall into place you know you don't get the outcomes that you want your definition of success doesn't necessarily materialize and so for us it's really important that we help children to find joy in what they're doing and linked to that is then trying and sometimes more challengingly but nevertheless as important is allowing your um, your colleagues to find joy in the work that they do. And sometimes, as I said, sometimes that's much more challenging, but nevertheless, it's a, it's an aspiration which you want to get to. And that's a much more, that's a much longer term, possibly longer term game, which requires you to be, you know, it's about incremental changes. If you can just make things a little bit better today and then make them a little bit better tomorrow, that you're just moving in that right direction to get that sense of an organization that has added center joy, I think is really important. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's something that a lot of leaders are wrestling with at the moment. Yeah, schools, schools do have a unique perspective on that. For leaders who are listening, who are going, well, yeah, but man, my team is really pushed. It's we've, we've really got some big deadlines. It's people are being stretched or we're, we're, we're hitting some impossible tasks, but we have to find a way. So what practical advice would you give for leaders to, of how to create that culture of joy in their teams? One of the fundamentals to to that sense of joy is, is around control of your, um, your, your, what you're doing, that you've got a clear outline, you've got a clarity of your job role, and you've got a clarity of um, the expectations, and you've got control over those. And it's understanding about those controllables. And I think I'm, I'm a very firm believer in focusing one's attention on the controllables 
and where we are as as leaders have the opportunity to provide our colleagues with the clarity around those job roles i think it's really really important because the thing that really knocks people is when they side swipe by additional responsibilities or additional things that that come out of nowhere or that they weren't necessarily aware they were responsible for um so i think that's that's important and i think it's trying to engender it's trying to engender in your 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 team this idea of self care and to take responsibility for their well being and to think about their well being in the context of themselves but also in the context of the organization that the inability to achieve the best that we possibly can if we aren't all um in the best state of mind that we are and i think that that becomes hard because i think sometimes you you work in organizations and you work with teams that are so committed and so dedicated that they find it really hard to give themselves permission to to step away from the emails to step away at the end of the night from the work that they've got to do um that they don't take the 5 minutes just to 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 be outside or to go down have a swim in, in the sea or go for a walk in the mountains or whatever it might be we'll go for a walk in the woods or just be outside for for 5 10 minutes and i think that's that's really important is is engendering that mindset in, into teams and and it's certainly something that on the back of the of the back of the pandemic is has been really important but at the same time it's really difficult because of the uncertainty that's come with it and the anxiety that bring that has been brought along with that for people to get themselves into that place where they do give themselves permission and i like to think that you know in in organizations we shouldn't individuals shouldn't have to um apologize for having a life that exists beyond work um we we should embrace the fact that people have other interests and that they are refreshed that they can reflect and then by doing so then we get we, we as an organization get more from um from them being engaged positive um and productive in in what they do with us yeah that's great advice um it's it's uh i love how important that is to you Pete because it's something like i said that a lot of leaders are only realizing now i think maybe because everyone's been redlining a bit through covid and well-being and remote work the great um uh, resignation particularly in the us people are asking the question okay uh the normal things aren't working how do we you know how do we push yeah. ourselves and and achieve great things and have a culture of joy so thank you for your advice there let's do a couple of leadership express questions as we land Pete the first one What is a book or you can give multiple that you have gifted to other people or recommended a lot to other people? Um let me just think there's a variety there's a variety internally at at particularly at school There's a book by a wonderful um professor at Cambridge University a lady by the name of Sarah Jane Blakemore um and she's written a really good book called Inventing Ourselves and it's the whole story about adolescent teenage brain um so for for my colleagues at school that's crucially important um and then the one that possibly more broadly that I that I often um talk about are two two books or one particular book of by a author Daniel Coyle which is the culture code and then before that he had written something called the talent code um and those two books are quite I'd quite like just because they're straightforward um practical understanding about um culture um and then about the development of talent and the concept of talent which I I just think is really interesting and that's possibly because of my background in psychology and most recently the book that i've been really interested in and been working with a lot in in conjunction to some of the things that i've been talking about today has been a book by owen eastwood called belonging
belonging is um, yeah, uh, it's Owen Eastwood. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. That came up in a recent podcast as well. So I'll have to be adding that to the list. And uh, I, I love it when books come up multiple times. It sort of always piques my interest. You know, you just yeah. look for the patterns. So great, um, great recommendations. What about right now? Is there anything you're in the middle of um, reading or are there podcasts, uh, blogs, any educational resources you love to follow or, or dig into that uh, you're enjoying there's, there's at the moment? Brilliant. Yeah, there's a, the one when I'm when I'm taking time away from from work and I'm out running. Um, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and the podcast that I'm I'm currently listening that that normally entertains me when I'm out, um, sort of um, plodding along the road um, or or through the fields is um, something called the High Performance. It's called the High Performance Podcast, and it's done by um, a chap by the name of Jake Humphreys um, and um, gosh, what's his sidekick's name? I forget his sidekick. Um, but the, the the guy that does it with him is a um, a sports psychologist, and they sit down with all range of people from from sport to business, etc., talking about what it means to be high performance and what their experiences are in achieving high performance and how people can learn from those experiences. So again, very, very useful, practical advice, some wonderful sound bites. Yeah, great recommendation. What about a recent leadership lesson you've learned for the first time or you've been reminded of something? That's a good question. I it's suppose, um I suppose, it, yeah no i think I, I think you got one there, there was <laughs> there was a book that there was a concept that that existed um um and and i've just been uh, reminded of it it's it, it it's written by an american um a, a former american uh navy commander a submarine navy uh commander um and um he had written he's he talks about a concept called intent based leadership um where you you imp not necessarily empowering he, he he get he gets worried about the concept of empowering people because he says you normally then just let them go and that the potential is that they go and do something wrong he said but you give them more accountability and more ownership of the roles that they are responsible for and so that's that's something that i that i often pick back up on um intent based leadership and i think the guy's name if i remember correctly is uh david marquet um, uh, okay us naval sub submarine commander wonderful that actually intent i'd say in my past 10 podcasts you're the third person to mention it and it hadn't come up in the first 130 and I just love that because I'd never heard of this until uh, about 10 podcast episodes ago with an, um, an Australian, Pat McIntosh, who chairs a board, uh, the board of a large not-for-profit here, with, which has, you know, they, I think they have about nine or 10,000 staff. And he's ex-military. Yeah. And so he talked oh, all wow. about... He talked all about intent and I was like, I've never heard of this. And now it's come up twice more. So, uh, for, yeah. So for those listening, I know you just mentioned it there in your own words, sorry to put you on the spot, but can you just give, yeah, a brief overview of what intent is for those listening and, and they can go and then read up on it to get a better idea. But to you, what does, what does intent mean? So, so to me, it's, it's, it's about giving people the ownership to come with you and to, to, to say, to sit down with you and, and and whether it's a project or whether it's initiative or whether it's a, an idea that they've got that the, the it, it comes back to simply they sit down and they simply say it's my intention to do x rather than saying you know rather than a sen sentence starting with can i do x or even me saying to them i want you to do x 
So it's them coming. It's about changing the relationship where they're coming and saying, it's my intention to do X. And it's about building within them that ability that they've got the expertise at their particular level, which they bring to you. So you don't go and fetch that information. They bring that information to you. And it's based on that trust and that built relationship where they then say, it's my intention to do this. And then you might say, then it might be a conversation of, instead of saying, um, I'm a bit unsure of that, or I'm, I'm not very confident in that working. Instead, it's posing the question back to them, how confident are you that it's going to be a success? So it's, it's, it's just the way in which we ask clever questions of those around us so that they can take ownership of what it is that they need to take ownership of. Yeah, that's, um, that's great. Thank you for giving us a quick overview. And I, it's such a great thought. I, I'd encourage everyone to go out and research it and, um, and look into it because I've found it as a really helpful filter. Um, and I'm always looking for those because otherwise, it, it, you know, leadership management people can be so confusing. But the idea of intent from, uh, from the military is, is a great, a great filter and great thought for all leaders. Uh, okay, last question, Pete, as we wrap up, if you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say to them? Build, build a, um, build a very strong team around you. Yeah, that's, that's such good advice. I'm, I'm a big believer in, um, the, I just think teams truly, it is one of the most wonderful things in life to lead a, a high or even just be, to be part of a truly high performance team that is working together. Um, it's just one of the best things in the world. So I love that. Love that. Yeah, piece I, of I just, I just think it's, it's the real, the realization of having a strong team around you is, is the appreciation that you don't know all the answers mm. and that you have those individuals around you that are there to to make decisions to make to make the calls um because they come with their expertise and that trust that exists within a strong team to be able to to share that idea that everyone's a part of the decision making that everybody is has ownership of the decisions that are made i think is really important Absolutely. So for those who've just loved hearing your thoughts on leadership, Pete, and a bit of your story, where can people find you online, LinkedIn or Twitter, et cetera? And also uh, where can people find Beads online? So Beads is um, www.beads.org. Um, my, I'm on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Beads Head um, on 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 Twitter and I'm, yeah, I'm just, uh, Pete Goodyear on LinkedIn. So quite easy to find, I suspect. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in so much fun chatting with Pete today and getting some stories and insights and yeah, just some great revelations and thoughts from, uh, the recent years as well, leading in the educational space. Um, for our listeners, don't forget, I also have the John O'White Leadership Podcast and the Leadership Question of the Day Podcast. So you can go and check those out to continue to grow in your leadership. But I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to you, Pete, for being so generous with your time and uh, sharing great stories and great leadership wisdom with us. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Absolute pleasure, John. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. It's been a real delight to have a have a conversation with you and thank you so much for your very insightful and um, um, wonderful questions. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. 
We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited, early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John O'White, or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. 95% uh, of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.